We now move on to the next class of medications, the antipsychotics, which, as their name implies, are typically used to treat schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. Antipsychotics are often divided into two main categories, the first generation, or typical antipsychotics, and the second generation, or atypicals. Broadly speaking, typical antipsychotics work harder at blocking the dopamine receptor, but because of this they can result in more motor and neurologic side effects. Conversely, atypicals have less affinity for the dopamine receptors, but can cause serious metabolic issues including obesity, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia. While the metabolic effects are more subtle, they are no less serious, so don't let anyone tell you that it's just weight gain. People with metabolic derangements can lose years off their lives, and this could account for one of the reasons why patients with mental illness are now recognized to live over a decade shorter than healthy controls. A quick high-yield tip. Something that is occasionally tested is the fact that antipsychotics work on the dopamine receptor subtype D2. This is somewhat controversial, as second-generation antipsychotics actually have relatively little activity at the D2 receptor, but remember it for testing purposes. How I remember this is to think of the D2 receptor as D2R. D2R kind of sounds like detour, so you can think of a psychotic person taking a detour from reality. Antipsychotics are, at least in the short term, remarkably effective at what they do. However, they also come with a wide array of side effects, often in proportion to how effective they are, which brings us back to the third rule of neurotransmission, with great power comes great responsibility. The efficacy of antipsychotics, as well as their side effects, largely derive from modulating dopamine in some way, shape, or form. Because of this, it will be helpful to review the effects of dopamine using our handy dopamine mnemonic. D for drive, O for psychosis, P for Parkinsonism, A for attention, M for motor, I for inhibition of prolactin, N for narcotics, and E for extrapyramidal. Let's go over these one by one. First, we'll focus on psychosis. By blocking dopamine, antipsychotics block one of the primary pathways that psychotic thoughts, including hallucinations and delusions, take in the brain. This graph illustrates the effect that five different antipsychotics have on the core symptoms of schizophrenia. Two other cognitive features that are affected by antipsychotics also relate to the functions of dopamine, specifically drive and attention. Something that people often get confused about when learning about these drugs is exactly what antipsychotics are targeting. Some students initially seem to think that antipsychotics target only psychotic thoughts, but this is not true. Antipsychotics target all thoughts, whether the patient is schizophrenic or not. On the screen is a quote from a study in which antipsychotics were given to healthy controls to illustrate their effects on people without active psychosis. As one patient put it, I feel slow but not sleepy. During the interview I feel clumsy, and I want to finish as fast as possible. It's difficult for me to explain what is happening to me. Keep in mind that this is a healthy person, not someone who is actively psychotic, starkly illustrating the effects of antipsychotics on drive and attention. Next we'll focus on how antipsychotics affect the body and induce features of Parkinson's disease. It sounds weird to think of it this way, but when you give your patients an antipsychotic, you are effectively giving them a form of medically induced Parkinson's disease, with all the motor and cognitive effects that go along with that. This mnemonic can help remind you that Parkinson's disease is an issue of too little dopamine. Parkinson's disease equals dopamine down. As a bonus, and we'll go over this more later, you can do a similar mnemonic with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease equals acetylcholine down. This video shows the stereotypic walk of someone who has been given a high dose of typical antipsychotics, which resembles almost exactly the walk of a patient with advanced Parkinson's disease, illustrating again that patients on antipsychotics are pathophysiologically similar to patients with Parkinson's disease. Soon after the introduction of the first antipsychotic, named Thorazine, this walk became known in the medical field as the Thorazine Shuffle. In which the patient will have a posture which will be stooped over, leaning forward, and then we'll have difficulty as far as initiating gait. When the gait is initiated, there are small steps. Oftentimes there's a, there's a tremor associated with this. And as the gait progresses, there may be a picking up of speed or what's called a fenestrated gait. And then in turning, instead of having the normal turning, the patient will turn on block, which means they'll turn almost as a statue moving around and then again having difficulty starting and the marsh petty pot. 
Next, we'll focus on the effects that blocking dopamine has on the motor pathways, including a discussion of the famous anti-yield extrapyramidal side effects. Extrapyramidal side effects are named because they are motor effects that occur outside of the medullary pyramids. While the medullary pyramids involve efferent tracts going primarily to voluntary muscles, the extrapyramidal tracts involve largely involuntary muscles. There are three main types of extrapyramidal side effects, and luckily for you, they progress in an easy-to-remember order. Acute dystonia hits in hours, akesthesia waits a few days, and finally akinesia creeps up slowly a couple weeks in. Remember these well, because they still show up on boards and on wards, even though first-generation antipsychotics are not used as often these days. Acute dystonia, which can hit in the first few hours after giving a first-generation antipsychotic, often looks something like this. When did, when did you start having trouble talking? Early this morning? Uh, and did you take any drugs? Uh, uh, other, other than your prescribed drugs? Oh. Uh, no? You don't uh, do cocaine or anything like that? Oh. Uh, 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 no? Uh, okay. Count to ten for me. One, two, four, four. Okay, that's good. I do. I feel better. I feel like I can talk. I don't know. I'm going to die like level one as well. That's so. As this video showed, management is with an anticholinergic agent such as diphenhydramine or Benadryl, which usually results in dramatic improvement. So be on the lookout for acute dystonia, as evidenced by muscles that won't stop contracting in the first few hours after giving an antipsychotic. The second extrapyramidal side effect is akesthesia, which the patient may start noticing a few days after beginning an antipsychotic, although some notice it almost immediately. Akesthesia is a constant jitteriness and restlessness of the muscles, which the patient experiences as being on edge or feeling the urge to move a lot. If you want to experience akesthesia for yourself, drink a couple shots of espresso and then force yourself to sit still. If you find yourself physically unable to do so and start feeling restless and jittery, you're on your way to feeling similar to patients with akesthesia. This isn't a minor thing either, and some patients find akesthesia to be so distressing that they consider suicide as a way to get away from it. The third and final extrapyramidal side effect is akinesia, also known as bradykinesia. This is a decrease in voluntary movements that usually happens a couple of weeks after an antipsychotic is started. This shows a person immobilized standing, even though they have been asked to demonstrate walking. This is termed akinesia, or without movement, although one can see the characteristic pill-rolling movement of thumb and index finger in both hands. The video we watched earlier of a patient with a Parkinsonian walk after being given an antipsychotic is another example of akinesia. So putting it all together, I like to remember the three extrapyramidal side effects in order as muscle, rustle, and hustle. Muscle refers to the contraction of muscles in acute dystonia. Rustle refers to the rustling movement and restlessness of patients with akinesia. And hustle refers to the Thorazine shuffle and other decreased movements characteristic of akinesia. Muscle, rustle, and hustle. One of the most feared outcomes of long-term use of a first-generation antipsychotic is known as tardive dyskinesia. Tardive dyskinesia is a constant involuntary rhythmic movement of the perioral muscles, as we will see in this video. Unlike the extrapyramidal side effects we've discussed thus far, which usually disappear once the antipsychotic is stopped, tardive dyskinesia does not always go away so easily and, indeed, can become irreversible if it goes on for too long.
There's about a 3-5% to chance of getting tardive for every year of being on a first-generation antipsychotic, so try to avoid long-term use of these in your patients. Because of its irreversible effects on a patient's quality of life, you need to know about tardive. When I hear tardive dyskinesia, I try to imagine someone chewing on tar. Chewing tardive. This video should help remind you of the chewing motion. Oh, it's a video of his face. Okay, uh, he's going early. <laughs> Another side effect of antipsychotic use is hyperprolactinemia. Think of the following case study. A male patient of yours that was recently started on risperidone, an atypical antipsychotic, comes in complaining that his breasts are getting larger. Rather than dismissing this as the psychotic ramblings of a crazy person, take the complaint seriously. As you recall from our dopamine mnemonic, one of dopamine's big roles in the brain is to inhibit prolactin. Once you start inhibiting dopamine itself, prolactin becomes unhinged and can cause enlargement of the breasts even in males. One antipsychotic which is notorious for this is risperidone. You can remember that risperidone gives rise to a pair of breasts by pronouncing it risperidone. Finally, we get to one of the most life-threatening outcomes of antipsychotic use, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. As a bit of trivia to help you memorize this, antipsychotics were formerly known as neuroleptics, which roughly means grabbing hold of the nerves. As the word malignant may imply, this is a serious event with about a 15% mortality rate. Patients with NMS often present with severe confusion, agitation, significant hyperthermia with a temperature in the range of above 105 degrees, and muscular rigidity. You, being a good clinician and history taker, are able to determine that the patient was recently started on a typical antipsychotic. Your diagnosis? Neuroleptic malignant syndrome. This video will illustrate how these patients appear. July 23rd, this is Brian in the hospital. He's been doing this for about 24 hours now. Still manages to fight his way out of his restraints pretty good, even with, you know, just a quick slip knot tied on him. He finds a way to loosen it up and then pull a little hard somehow. He's got all four of them on, and he's been doing this all day and all night, and he's still not tired. Hey, Brian. Can you look over here at me? Hi. Yep. He's got 101 temperature as of right now. He came in the hospital with close to 108. Pretty much uh, cooked his internal organs. Brain. How do you treat NMS? The answer is dantrolene, a muscle relaxant. I had a difficult time remembering to correlate dantrolene with NMS until I came up with the phrase, Dan never missed a step, to remind me of some dancing guy named Dan who, despite being kind of gross and sweaty, is actually a pretty good dancer and never misses a step. So now we have Dan correlated with NMS, or neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Alternatively, dopamine agonists such as bromocryptine can be used. One last note on antipsychotic dosing forms before we get to the individual antipsychotics. Because patient compliance plays such a large role in the treatment of schizophrenia, with outpatient compliance rates hovering at about 40%, the dosage forms of antipsychotics should be addressed. First, PO meds are the most straightforward way, but it is dependent upon the patient being willing and able to take it regularly, which you cannot assume in this patient population. Several antipsychotics have dissolvable forms available to prevent cheeking of meds, where the patient pretends to take the pill but later spits it out. These drugs dissolve on the tongue and are absorbed in seconds, which can help more of the drugs to be administered, but on the downside, they are often very expensive and can only be given in an inpatient hospital setting. Intravenous antipsychotics are the gold standard as they have 100% bioavailability by definition but they can only be safely administered within a hospital, so this is generally used for acute in-hospital management of agitation and psychosis. Intramuscular, or IM, injections can be beneficial in severely agitated patients where IV access is difficult to obtain. In addition, there are IM depot forms of several antipsychotics, which last for several weeks after injection, allowing for long-term control in patients who will not or cannot take medications regularly. One important thing to note when using the depot form of an antipsychotic is to make sure that the patient has been tried on the particular medication first before giving it as a depot. 
Once you give a depot, they are stuck with it for several weeks. So if your patient is allergic, they get a few awful weeks and you get a malpractice lawsuit. You can remember this using the rhyming phrase PO before depot. Now we move on to the individual antipsychotics, going over a few high yield facts about each. Let's start with the first generation or typical antipsychotics. The very first antipsychotic, named chlorpromazine or brand name Thorazine, was discovered back in 1950. Chlorpromazine was originally developed as an anesthetic for use in the OR, but it proved unsuccessful in that regard. However, it was noted in trials to have calming effects on psychotic patients and quickly came into widespread use for that purpose. Today, however, it is rarely used because of its wide side effect profile. As you can see from the neurotransmitters involved, chlorpromazine targets not only dopamine, but also acetylcholine, norepinephrine, and histamine receptors, resulting in the wide variety of effects observed, including memory impairment from blocking acetylcholine, hypotension from blocking norepinephrine, and sedation from blocking histamine, in addition to all the side effects from blocking dopamine that we discussed earlier. One high yield side effect of chlorpromazine that is occasionally tested is the fact that long-term use can lead to sediment deposits in the cornea. I try to remember this using the phrase chlorineal deposits from chlorpromazine. Contrast this with another typical antipsychotic known as thioridazine, brand name Melaril. In contrast to chlorpromazine, which had chlorineal deposits, thioridazine has retinal deposits. You are unlikely to see this in real life unless you're an ophthalmologist, but it shows up on boards sometimes. Haloperidol, brand name Haldol, is the most famous of the first generation of antipsychotics, and it remains in use today. In comparison with chlorpromazine and thioridazine, haloperidol is much more selective for the D2 receptor and therefore has less anticholinergics, antihistaminic, or antiadrenergic effects. However, because it attacks the D2 receptor so strongly, there is a high rate of extrapyramidal side effects, including acute dystonia, akesthesia, and akinesia, the muscle wrestle and hustle talked about earlier. In common clinical practice, Haloperidol is sometimes referred to as Holdol because it is commonly used for when a patient is acutely psychotic and needs chemical restraints. Haloperidol is one of the drugs with a depot formulation, allowing for long-term effects in patients with only a single monthly injection. Before giving a depot shot, however, what do we have to do? Make sure that they've had the drug PO before, otherwise we can end up with a nasty long-term allergic reaction. On tests, you'll need to recognize that the decanoate form, as in Haloperidol decanoate or Flufenazine decanoate, signifies an IM depot form. How to remember this? I try to link the decanoate with the word decade, which reminds us that decanoate forms last for a long period of time. Obviously not 10 years, but several weeks to a month, with a complete washout taking 3 to 5 months. While there are many more typical antipsychotics than the three we talked about, those are the ones you'll most likely need to know for boards and wards. Let's move on to the second generation, or atypical class of antipsychotics which, as you'll remember, have much less neurologic side effects like EPS, but also have more metabolic and endocrine side effects such as weight gain, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia. The first of the atypical antipsychotics that we'll go over is clozapine, brand name Clozaril. Clozapine is routinely regarded as the single most effective agent that we have in the fight against schizophrenia. So why don't we use it all the time? Clozapine has a rare but potentially deadly side effect known as agranulocytosis, where all of a patient's white blood cells are depleted, resulting in overwhelming infection and even death. It's about a 1% chance during the first year of going on clozapine, but because of the possibility of death, clozapine is never a first-line treatment for schizophrenia despite its peerless efficacy. For patients who have failed two or more trials of other antipsychotics, however, it has about a 60% chance of efficacy if the patient can tolerate it without developing any side effects. You can remember the association of clozapine and agranulocytosis by thinking that you have to watch clozapine closely to monitor for agranulocytosis. Because of these risks, patients who are started on clozapine have to be entered into a registry to keep track of them. In addition, a baseline absolute neutrophil count, or ANC, needs to be obtained before starting treatment, with serial ANCs throughout the first year. Clozapine must be discontinued immediately if the ANC falls below 1500. So if clozapine is effective but potentially deadly, what other options do we have? The next atypical antipsychotic to consider would be olanzapine, or Zyprexa. In a large trial of different antipsychotics, olanzapine was found to be second only to clozapine in terms of efficacy, but without the risk of agranulocytosis. For this reason, olanzapine is an excellent first-line medical treatment for schizophrenia, and is among the most widely prescribed of all antipsychotics. So what's the downside? As mentioned before, atypical antipsychotics have a higher rate of metabolic side effects, and olanzapine is one of the worst in this regard. Patients on olanzapine have a propensity to gain weight independently of caloric intake. 
I remember this association by emphasizing the O part of olanzapine and thinking about an obese person. Think O for obesity. Moving on through the atypicals, we next hit risperidone, brand name Risperdal. Risperidone is your bread and butter second generation antipsychotic with a low risk of EPS, but a higher risk of metabolic side effects. So what's unique about risperidone? Clinically, risperidone can be useful because it's on the less sedating side, which can be great in elderly patients. So think rise and shine with risperidol. As stated before, risperidone seems to have a higher chance of causing gynecomastia as well, with the mnemonic risperidone gives rise to a pair. Another bread and butter atypical antipsychotic is ketiapine, brand name Seroquel. Ketiapine is similar to risperidone, with the exception of it being much more sedating clinically. You can remember this by thinking ketiapine for quiet time. Another atypical antipsychotic that we will cover is ziprazidone, brand name Geodon. What is unique to remember about ziprazidone? Ziprazidone has gained some notoriety for prolonging the QT interval, which is a frequently tested point. What other drug have we covered that also did this? That's right, it was Selexa, or mnemonic Selexis. Using the car mnemonic can also help us here. Look at this picture of a Geometro. When you think of Geodon, I want you to think of a Geometro, which is a zippy car. Like Selexis, a Geo also requires us to do an electrocardiogram. The last atypical antipsychotic we'll cover is Aripiprazole, brand name Abilify, which is one of the newer antipsychotics on the market. It's unique in that it is both a dopamine and a serotonin partial agonist, so its effects are somewhat different in clinical practice. Aripiprazole does not completely block D2 receptors, but rather locks them in at about 25% of maximum stimulation, which can be helpful for maintenance therapy, but rarely works for an acute psychotic episode, where a more powerful antagonist may be required. One way to remember the unique mechanism of Abilify is to rename the drug and Abilify to remind you that it has two distinct neurotransmitters that it hits, dopamine and serotonin. Because of this dual mechanism involving serotonin, and Abilify is often used to augment an antidepressant. So while prescribing just aripiprazole for depression is not FDA approved, prescribing an antidepressant and aripiprazole could help in the treatment of refractory cases of major depression. As a final note, recall from the psych MD mnemonic that psychosis should be treated by a physician trained in mental health and is not suitable for treatment in a primary care setting. Nevertheless, you should be aware of the common treatment strategies for schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders, especially since many antipsychotics have metabolic and neurologic side effects that you may be required to help treat. Here's a quick high yield review of the major concepts and mnemonics that we've covered here. Make sure you know and understand the meaning behind each of these, or if not, you can rewind and review any relevant parts. Break time. See you in the next lecture.